this afternoon. How are you guys enjoying the conference? Okay, some energy, I like that. Um, so we don't, we decided backstage that we do not like long, wieldy introductions. So this is Toby. Yeah, and, and this um, is Chrissy. <laughs> For those who don't know us, um, and Toby has a new job. Do you want to tell us about your new job? Yeah, um, as of about June, I, I am a executive uh, advisor for Google Cloud and Health. So, what does that mean? Uh, that means that I do just about what they want me to do, <laughs> uh, and uh, so that has been an opportunity to help them with strategy. Uh, around healthcare uh, and uh, begin to talk about uh, how they're uh, going to uh, try and use cloud, particularly in healthcare. Okay, so let's get real about cloud. Um, the, you know, people say that this is, for a long time, people have been talking about the cloud and we've seen it get into other industries. Healthcare seems like a different beast. Um, people will tell you, in my line of work, there are things that people tell you on the record and there are things that they tell you off the record. And off the record, I still definitely hear from healthcare executives that they are very worried about the cloud, that they don't know if it can keep their data secure. Um, what's, your, what's your line of thinking on that? So let me give you the history um, for the Cleveland Clinic. Uh, back in about 2008, um, we had a data center that was uh, in a, a basement of a building and the, and the building was running out of electricity to run this and periodically it would flood and we realized that computers really didn't do very well underwater without electricity. By the way, this is the data center you offered to sell me backstage. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so we had to make a decision right then uh, what we were going to do, and we had the discussion was uh, we were gonna to go to the cloud, and there was tremendous anxiety amongst the IT professionals in our group about the security of the data in healthcare. And in fact, I talked to several CEOs are a few CEOs of uh, major corporations who subsequently have uh, huge uh, cloud services, uh, and they didn't have particular interest in having healthcare uh, data. Now what's happened is that the healthcare data is exploding. We're swimming mm -hmm. in data. Um, and just, a, a, you know, the, the amazing thing to me is that the total amount of knowledge in healthcare is doubling every 73 days. There are 5,600 journals putting out 800,000 articles a year. Um, there's more information in a mammogram than there is in the New York City phone book. Uh, there is uh, three billion base pairs in the, in the human genome. We just can't keep track of all this. And so we need a place to store the information in a secure place, organize it, and then be able to have the advantage of analyzing it. And so to me, uh, the cloud is clearly more secure than our data center. There are professionals that run it. Uh, mm -hmm. We're sort of semi-pros. Um, and uh, in the, in just the pure finances of maintaining every hospital in the country maintaining its own data center is crazy. So you are a cloud convert at this point? I, I'm for, <laughs> I think that cloud has got tremendous opportunities in healthcare to manage the data. Um, so I want to I want to talk about something um, that is hilariously controversial, which is the electronic medical record. Hilarious! Um, <laughs> I never found any doctors like thought it was hilarious. Topic, but this is a crowd that has a lot of opinions about that. Um, so you actually um, brought Epic into Cleveland Clinic. Um, that was your decision, and yep. you were fairly early in doing so. What yeah. year was it? We were the first major organization after Kaiser to adopt. Um, Epic. In so fact, we did that in 2005. Okay. And so all of our facilities all over the world are Epic. Do you regret that? No. Uh, tell me more about that. Well, you know, if you look at um, the choices that you have right now for electronic medical records, you know, I think that the majority of major academic medical centers in, uh, around the country have looked at all the alternatives and have voted for Epic. If you look at what is a year ago, um, Partners in Boston, Vanderbilt, Mayo Clinic, um, uh, let's see, uh, Johns Hopkins, you know, they all ditched their uh, homegrown electronic medical record and went to Epic. Uh, so, you know, I think it's probably as good as it gets, but it makes everybody crazy. And um, I don't think there's a perfect system. So if one of these entrepreneurs in the crowd said, Toby, I, I got a new medical record to sell you, 
um, and you were and you were at Cleveland Clinic. Um, would you be open to that conversation? Yeah, for about a millisecond. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think that the, the issue is, I mean, take take Mass General for example. Mass General just spent 1.3 billion dollars to bring the electronic medical record in. Not only did they have to, to uh, redo it, but they had to train all of their employees. I don't think that if you went to them and said, look, we've got the greatest thing that's ever happened in electronic medical record, uh, and they're going to say, well, that's very nice. We're just going to chuck this last uh, $1.3 billion and, and bring in something new. I, I think it, the, and there's now 95% of the facilities in the countries uh, have electronic medical records of one sort or another. I think the horse is out of the barn on that one, frankly. I think you can build something on top of the electronic medical mm -hmm. record that will make it so a physician, when he goes and let's say he sees a, a colon problem, gets all the relative data and the history relative to colon issues uh, for him and, and shortcuts all this. And I think, uh, I think frankly, the killer app is going to be voice, um, which uh, eventually will take a lot of that out. And you're starting to see part of it with Augmetics right now, with, which has uh, Google, Google Glass, Glass yeah. uh, Google Glass, and uh, a scribe in India or someplace. So, what what do you think? You know, drilling down into voice, because I'm sure there are a lot of voice companies here today. A lot of them have been funded in the past six months. Um, what do you think is actually realistic, say, in the next six months to a year, that voice these voice companies could actually do in healthcare? Oh, well, I'm not an expert on this. We've got more experts in the audience than I am on, on this one, but. Uh, I think it's going to be, uh, it's a big challenge, and I think it's going to have to be specialty by specialty done. Uh, and probably the hardest is the primary care physician, because the primary care physician doesn't see anything that walks in the door. But if you're, let's say you're an ENT doctor, there's a certain number of things that are, you can, you, you have to, questions you have to ask and things that you have to put in the chart. Uh, that's not the whole spectrum of disease. So. I think you'll start to see picking off of voice and very specialty by specialty, and probably the last ones are going to be the, the primary care docs. Um, so I don't know if you like classical mythology, but I heard this great story um, from someone I was talking to at the conference today, um, and it was about a, I loved it because it was about this woman who was a, a famous kind of huntress, um, and a lot of men wanted to marry her, and she said, I will marry the man who could beat me in a foot race. And a lot of people died trying to beat her in a foot race because that was the deal. You know, where you is it? Where is this going? Killed. Where is this going? Okay, I promise you, it's, it's a good story. <laughs> and so, someone, some dude came along and said, "I have an idea." Managed to get three golden apples. And as she was doing running, they were running together in this race. He kept flopping down the apples, and she would get distracted and look at the apples, and that's how she lost the race. So this is a, a story that was shared with me on just not getting distracted and sticking to your core competencies. So now you see where I'm going with this, I hope. Um, you're now working in tech. You have tons of resources. You could pretty much do anything in healthcare, and I'm sure you've seen tons of problems that you could solve. So what do you actually do, if anything, and how do you make sure you're not just getting distracted and losing in other areas? Well, I think that's a, that's a great question because um, interestingly, and I've talked to several companies, this is not just relative to Google, and they are fascinated by the idea of dealing with the most difficult problems there are in healthcare, like curing cancer. I'm for curing cancer, but um, you know, the, but there are screaming needs in healthcare right now, just in the delivery of care. And I have to go back uh, for a second and sort of set the stage, because if you look at uh, providers right now, health hospitals across the United States, 20% of them are running in the red. And a really financially successful hospital will run about a 3% margin. And struggling to do that, just to put it in perspective, the Cleveland Clinic is about a $9 billion organization. Um, and we realized that we had to take a billion dollars out of cost. And over the last four or five years, we've taken a billion dollars out. That's a big bite um, out to, just to keep uh, our 3% margin. So, what, we're, what the hospitals are looking for, uh, and I speak probably most uh, knowledgeably about hospitals and providers, is they're looking for something that is going to be help the efficiency uh, and help uh, uh, of the hospital by taking costs out. Um, so where, where can they do that? Well, first of all, there's a screaming need to handle all this data. 
and, and certainly we're not efficient at running data centers and we've got so much data we've got to find a way to take care of it. The second thing is think about the two bookends of healthcare. If you're going to a hospital, you, first of all, or a hospital or any, any professional, you got to make an appointment. We have 500 people now who are in a call center 24 hours a day who are taking calls. And you know, the, and it's, there's delays and there's miscommunication. You ought to be able to get, uh, write an algorithm to get people who've got a headache into the Neurologic Institute to be looked after. Uh, and uh, that would be A, efficient, and B, uh, take costs out. Think about the other end of the thing where the money is. We have to send out bills. Um, and that's $9 billion of bills that go out. We have 2,000 people that work in revenue cycle. These go, they go through the chart, they look at the diagnosis, they sign the code, they then sign the payer, and then they uh, print the bill and send it out. You ought to be able to automate that somehow. Uh, and you probably get the bill right. The bills are terrible. Yeah, I can attest and, to that. And absolutely ununderstandable, most of them. Um, and so you ought to be able to put out a reasonable bill uh, in a reasonable amount of time. I think the time cost of money in that. And the 2,000 people that you probably eliminate half of anyhow. So it sounds like you know, where you might direct Google is to look at some of these low-hanging fruit and just in the operations side yeah, of I medicine, mean, the I mean, unsexy just side. Just think if, if I am the CFO of a hospital or whatever, and you came in and, and a company, regardless of what the company is, and you saved me a ton of money, Man, I'd love you, and I'd want you to give you all my data, and you know, come on in with your next great thing. So that's a that's a good pitch. Then I'll save you money. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, that's the reality of the, some of the problems we have in actually running things. Uh, and I mean, the other thing is, you know, think how hard it is to get to see a, a, a care provider. Um, we went uh, a few years ago. We had an interesting story. Uh, and you always learn things from patient stories. And so we had a patient call up and said, uh, I need to uh, see a urologist. So they gave him an appointment in two weeks. Turned out the guy is in urinary retention and can't pee. That's a long time to not pee. It, yeah, it's a very long time to not pee. <laughs> She's got the making of a great doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Missed career. <laughs> So anyhow, um, so what we said was you gotta, you gotta find out when people need to be seen. So everybody calls up now, we say, do you need to be seen today? And so as a result, we see 1.3 million same day appointments. Uh, and think how hard that is. I mean, the getting in to, the, to see a caregiver and getting a bill out are two of the screaming needs and, and that have to be addressed. And you address those, you're, you're helping a lot of people. So I've had a few questions here on just um, what is Google doing in healthcare, and I think it's it's honestly is a fair question because we have you know Verily that seems to be doing something, we have Google Cloud, there's Google Brain. So is there some strategy that brings these groups together, or are they all kind of doing their own thing? So you've got you've got Verily, Calico, which is drug development. You've got um, DeepMind in London, yep. which um, and you have Brain, Brain Health, and Net. Cloud. Potentially, and so all of these, uh, all yeah, and so all of these right now are working on various things, and it's not a very coordinated approach. And so the, they're now trying to decide, you know, what will be the big strategy for Google across healthcare. And what do you think that strategy should be? Uh, I think I'll pass on that one. <laughs> Um, so I got to ask you about a company that I'm sure we've all heard of for the wrong reasons, and that's Theranos. Um, because at one point in time, um, you did, you know, you talked to people in the press about this company, and, and mm -hmm. I think to be fair, what you said was something along the lines of, if this was something that could actually work, it would be cool. Yeah. Um, so do you re do you regret saying kind of anything about about a company that ended up getting the reputation? No. That it I, did? So so well, let me tell you what I did. First of all, we did not. The Cleveland Clinic did not invest. I did not invest. I didn't have any pay anything uh, with Theranos. <clears throat> I did, however, feel that if Theranos worked, it was such an, a tremendous game changer that I w I thought the Cleveland Clinic could be in the front row with this. So what I said was that if you send me the, the uh, device, uh, we will test it. And if the tests are great, uh, we will write about it, publish it. 
if the tests are bad, we'll publish that too. And we never got advice. Yeah, I wonder why that is. <laughs> so I, I mean, I, I, I thought that if that could happen, I mean, that's, that, that would be a game changer. But um, so, um, you know, it was, uh, and I don't regret the fact that we're out there trying to find something that could make a substantial difference, um, but it didn't work. Has, has that been a lesson for you at all in, in supporting entrepreneurs? Would no, you... no, I, I th you know, so, so let, me go, let me go back a, a little bit and sort of tell you about sort of my background. Uh, you know, I was doing a lot of things with devices um, and a lot of them didn't work. And some of them didn't work because uh, the timing was not right. I remember one of the things that I did is I had an experience in the operating room where uh, we had a hole in the left ventricle, uh, inter interventricular septal defect from a heart infarct. And I tried to sew it up and the tissue was mush and couldn't sew it up and every stitch I put in pulled through and after multiple hours in the operating room, they lost the patient. So I came back out of that and I said, there's gotta be a different way to do this because you know, this just doesn't work. So what I did was we developed, first of all, two balloons that we thought we could put one through the side and blow it up and it looked like a Frisbee. And then blow it on the other side that looked like another Frisbee and we'd lock them together. Um, and, um, and that went on to develop two umbrellas that went through the hole and opened up and another one had opened up on the other side and they locked together. Well, the company that I was working with, Edwards, uh, said, well, yeah, no one's ever gonna treat the heart with a catheter. <laughs> now, patent ductuses, ASDs, uh, they all get closed with that device and there's something called PTCA that came along with the catheters and valves and all the rest of it. But it was before, it was before its time. Yeah. And people just weren't ready for it. And so, you know, I don't mind uh, looking at things that may seem before their time um, because sometimes, you, you know, there's got to be a first in an area. And so you're going to knock on the door and you're going to kiss a lot of frogs, but you've got to do it. <laughs> so maybe that was a frog. Uh -huh. uh, so, you know, this, I think this feeds into one of the things we were just talking about, which is medical education. Um, and you've talked about how the system creates physicians who may have at one point wanted to take risks and, and yeah. be entrepreneurial, but, this, but it kind of beats it out of them. So, um, so how do we change that, create doctors who want to take more risks and, and start so, companies? So this has been one of the things that I've always thought was fascinating. You know, if you stop and think about um, how you got into medical school, you got into medical school because you got through organic chemistry. <laughs> Weeds a lot of people out. Yeah, I, we did, me. <laughs> you know, I was fingernails getting through that. Um, but, you know, and that was just pure memory. And then you get to medical school and you spend four years memorizing. And then you become an intern uh, to, and you do what the chief resident tells you to do. And then you become a chief resident and do what the junior staff tells you to do. And then you become a junior staff and do what the chief staff tells you to do. So you arrive at 35 or 45 uh, and never and learning how to follow the company line and not get out of line and not really being encouraged to have an independent thought. So you've been selected and then trained uh, to not be entrepreneurial and not to be inventive. Now the sad part about this is that, um, that the time from a new idea being proven to be successful or being approved by the FDA or whatever to the time it's standard of care is 13 years. That's almost the half-life of a doctor. So, so think about this. Basically, it says if you haven't been trained in your medical school or if you haven't been trained in your residency, you're probably not going to do it because you've been trained, you haven't been trained to do it and you haven't been uh, encouraged to be risk taker. So what do we do about that? Well, that's an issue. And, you know, I always thought that what was going to happen is that as uh, health care became more visual and the communication system improved, that this is going to speed the whole process up. But, the, you know, and it has, because, I mean, I, I've taught uh, surgical techniques on five continents by televising. Uh, and 
so that, that's helped, but at the same time, we've had this explosion in new technology. The AR and VR type systems? Well, not, I mean, think about, um, so, so let, me, let me give you an example from my experience. So I started out as a, a thoracic surgeon, and I did lung surgery, esophageal surgery, diaphragm surgery, aortic surgery, uh, coronary bypass surgery, valve surgery, aneurysm, you know, the whole thing. I did all it all. The surgeries from like here to Yeah, here. that's right, about here. <laughs> and it, it wound up because of the technology and the, uh, was so, got to be so sophisticated that I almost wound up doing nothing but mitral valve surgery. And, and that's what's happened in most specialties, that you become, to become really good, you gotta do a lot of something, and the more sophisticated it is, the less of something you do. So, it's, so the, the challenge is not just the education, the challenge is also um, the vast amount of information and the vast amount of technology that there is. So it's, it's a, I, I don't have a really great, great solution for it, but you know, I, one thing I do recognize is that <clears throat> Physicians now uh, can't do it all. It's a team, a team event. And that, um, and you know, just between us kids here, um, doctors are not particularly good team players. It's not a natural act for them. <laughs> so, so what we've done is we, we've entered into a, sort of a new experiment um, that we're building a new uh, health education campus. And there's two things we want to do in it. We're bringing in doctors, nurses, uh, dentists, and physician assistants. They're all going to be trained there together as a team. So when you come in you, as a medical student, you're going to get a patient, and you're going to have a medical student, a nursing student, uh, a dentist, dental student, a PA, and probably a social worker following this patient along as a team. So you're going to learn team play. The other thing I think that is going to be exciting is we're going to rely more and more on technology. What kind of tech? Ah, uh, this is, I thought you'd never ask. <laughs> um, one of the, one of the um, really exciting things is HoloLens uh, I, and uh, this augmented from reality. From a company that isn't Google. That's right, it's from Microsoft. <laughs> uh, and it turns out that um, a friend of mine called me up and said, come on out here, I, I want you to see this. And um, I went out and I was completely blown away by it. And I said, we could use that in teaching anatomy. So we've been working with them and Case Western Reserve University. So the other day I'm walking around a heart that's out this big out in space and you can walk all the way around it. And after, you know, I'm kind of ooing and eyeing, and I, they say, Toby, stick your head in. So I go like this, my head's in the left ventricle and I'm looking at the outflow tract uh, I'm looking at the aortic valve from the underside, a view I've never had before as 30 years as a heart surgeon. And you can now, see, you can now look at the brain and you can see the paths uh, going through the brain uh, with augmented reality. And think about you know, the teaching that you can do, the patient education that you can do, think about the experiments you can do. I mean, you can put a molecule out in space and walk around the molecule and understand it in a, a three-dimensional way you never could before. So and then, I, then, I, then I have thought a lot about MOOCs. Uh, oh, the uh, online education? Yeah. Now, can you imagine if you were teaching organic chemistry, that every year you come in to teach a bunch of medical students the Krebs cycle, and they couldn't care less about, <laughs> and you go around and around the Krebs cycle over and over. That must be the most awful thing for a teacher to have to do that same thing over and over. So, uh, you know, so you're and, saying inflict the torture once. Sorry? Inflict the torture one time. Yeah, I mean, if they could go and make a video so that you could go and so you, you as a student could study it whenever you wanted to. Um, even if you wanted to work on the weekend, you could do it then. Um, so you could, and you could go back and forth over the lecture and learn it. And I just think that that democratizes education in a way that hasn't been done so far. And I think that's a tremendous opportunity there. Very cool. Um, so I'm going to shift topics a little bit to um, another tech company I'm interested in, and that is Amazon. Um, what do you think of the Atul Gawande hire? Well, he wasn't. He, that's BBD. Bezos, Buffett, and uh, Diamond. I call it. I call it ABC. <coughs> okay. <laughs> so we can fight about that, or tell no, me. Uh, yeah. So Gwande, what do you think? Um, 
Well, first of all, uh, these are three iconic companies with great leaders. Uh, you know, these are these are three terrific thinkers and doers. Um, and uh, the, the the history is that uh, Warren Buffett's number two guy has been thinking Todd. about this. Hmm? Todd Coombs. Yes, has been thinking about this for six years. Um, and you know, this uh, triumvirate came together rather rapidly. Um, Do you know how that happened? Because in my mind, it's like on a yacht or a pli private plane or something like that. <laughs> uh, three Combs years. is on the board of Jamie Dimon's build of, of uh, J.P. Morgan. Okay. And so that's how that's th those two came together. And then apparently, about six months before it was announced, uh, Jeff, they t approached Jeff Bezos, and he jumped on it. Um, and uh, so I have tremendous respect for Atul Gawande. He probably writes about as well as anybody that I have ever written, um, with, of course, except for you. I'm not offended. <laughs> He's way better than me. Um, so and, and, and so, um, uh, and I, I tried to hire Atul Gawande um, 10 years ago. And uh, we were in discussions with him when this came up. To, uh, to come to the Cleveland Clinic. My successor uh, was talking with them and they had trained together. And it, it just uh, along in the middle of the discussions, he said, I've got a proposal, it's a big deal, and I don't think I'll be coming to the Cleveland Clinic. So I think, uh, and I, I'm not sure that they've just hired a new uh, COO. That's Jack Stoddard. Yes. Formerly of Accolade, which I was presenting. <laughs> yes. Today. And, you know, I think that. You know what he did at uh, Comcast. I think uh, made important what's gonna they're gonna try and do, which is um, navigators to, and you know uh, you know doctors uh, recommendations for doctors, uh, etc. So I was just gonna ask you if Amazon's gonna disrupt healthcare, and then I remember that you hate that term. Um, <laughs> so now I want to ask you why you hate that term. Disruption. Well, yeah. Well, disruption, I, I think um, you have to understand that healthcare is the biggest industry in the United States. Um, and uh, to disrupt something, I think you have to completely change it. And I think probably you're not going to just change this huge industry overnight. I think that there will be lots of opportunities to begin to change aspects of it. And God knows we need changes of aspects of it. But it's not going to be like, boom, it's all different now. Um, I think they can have a major effect on purchasing. Um, they may well, uh, that group, uh, the three of them, may have um, a uh, insurance approach. Uh, they may do accolade. Um, so we'll see. So there are a lot of monopolies in healthcare, very big entrenched players that um, sometimes don't look kindly to some of these innovators who might be here in the in the audience. Is there is there reason to be enthusiastic, optimistic that a technology company could potentially come along and threaten some of these monopoly players in a way that, you know, potentially a startup doesn't have the resources and the budget to be able to do? Yeah, I think there's certainly opportunities for good ideas that can come from any place and can, can change it. I think probably what you see in the, in the pharmaceutical world may be the, may be uh, the model, and what happens is you see these com the companies find a new compound or drug or bio, uh, and uh, they're purchased uh, by a company that's got a big sales force uh, and it's international. Um, and uh, many of these major companies have reduced their R&D budgets uh, and have depended upon purchasing uh, startups that bring new technologies. And so I. I think that that may well be the route that you see. Um, so what could tech companies, I mean, because you definitely see a lot of skepticism about tech from you know, folks who are in your world, um, doctors, health system CEOs, insurance executives, think that all these tech people are sort of flashy and, and driving hype without delivering. Um, why do you think that is? And um, what do you think that tech could legitimately do in this space? Well, for, well, first of all, um, you know, I, I alluded to this earlier. I think that it's important to solve a problem. And I think you need to go and find out what the problem is uh, and then address it with tech. 
uh, and I don't, I don't think that's done in a fishbowl. I mean, I don't think you can go and, I mean, I never got very good ideas lying in my bath and thinking about the world and how I was going to change it. Generally, I wound up going and seeing what a problem was and trying to direct a, direct a solution to the problem. And frequently, I'd go and get ideas wherever I could get ideas. So I, I think you have to get messy inside the uh, healthcare system, if you will, to find out what the problems are and then how you go and address those particular issues. And you know, I one of the wonderful things that I see here is this incredible intellectual capabilities um, that are bringing uh, new uh, opportunities to, to enhance how we look after people. Uh, but um, you, you, I think you cannot do it totally from outside. And you know, I can think of a couple of companies that I've known for some time um, that went a long ways down the road and didn't have a single doctor involved and then got thrown in the penalty box by the FDA because um, they didn't understand the system. Um, and but, so there is, you know, a, a lot of people involved in the FDA, the, the, you know, the regulatory people, the purchasers, the whole thing. It's a complicated system and you, you have to understand the, the name of the game and the rules of the game in order to get in and, and really define the problem and how you're going to deal with it. And I think sometimes that has been a neglected part of uh, how tech has been developed. And do you, do you see Silicon Valley companies as sort of realizing this and starting to hire some of the, the top doctors and you know, folks out of the FDA and out of traditional healthcare industry? Is that happening enough? You know, I, I can't speak for the whole industry, but I, you know, I do see more of that happening. Uh, you've seen Verily do some of that. You, you know, I don't know how I wound up here, but here I am. Um, <laughs> And, um, but, you know, increasingly, I think that a lot of people, <coughs> excuse me, who come out through the medical school want to spin off into uh, tech. Uh, a lot of coming through medical school and then their residency then uh, are entering uh, more entrepreneurial companies, uh, which I think is great. And we have one more question about, about tech before I ask you something I've been meaning to ask you. Uh -oh. um, so get ready. Um, so one of our audience members wants to know your thoughts on blockchain applications of decentralizing medical data so that patients can own their own data. Um, so what do you think about that? Yeah, I think that you know a lot of companies are talking about this, particularly around electronic medical record data and uh, making sure that it's secure um, and uh, people don't. By the uh, way, do you understand what the blockchain is? Because I'm I'm still struggling with that one. A, dis a dispersed ledger. Led <laughs> Ledger. Kind and, of makes sense. And so if you got it in six different places, it probably is going to be hard to change all six ones at the same time. That's a poor cardiac surgeon's knuckle dragger. <laughs> but I like that definition. Um, so you, you, do you see potential for the blockchain? I do. Oh, okay. Yes, I do. What about Bitcoin? What about Bitcoin? No, come on, no. <laughs> this is, I thought this was healthcare, not finance. <laughs> Um, all right, so back to something um, I know you, you do like to talk about, which is um, your, you know, your relationship with the VA. Um, and you have been working with the VA, but you actually turned down um, two different administrations on being the secretary of the VA. Um, and that was one was Trump and the other one was Obama. Um, so who was more tempting? <laughs> I think rather than answering the question, I'm going to tell you the history. Um, <laughs> so um, you know, President Obama asked me to take the job uh, just after the uh, scandal about the waiting list at the VA. And it, he had 18 months left in the administration. And the VA is, uh, I didn't know very much about anything about the VA, but the VA is a huge organization. <clears throat> there are uh, 360,000 people that work for the VA. The majority are unionized. Uh, the budget is $180 billion. There's 165 hospitals across the country. Uh, and, um, and you had 18 months to try and change the culture of this vast organization. I didn't think it was possible. And so I wrote him a letter, um, and I made a mistake in this. I said, look, I can't take the job, but I'll help you any way I can with a VA. 
Uh, my payment for that was that I spent 10 months on a commission on care studying the VA and making a recommendation going back and forth to Washington. So I learned a lot about the VA in the process. Um, the VA, for example, there are 22 million veterans in the United States. Six million of them get any care at all from the VA. Two million get all their care from the VA. So essentially you've got two million people uh, that this huge uh, organization is set up to handle. And by the way, it's about three hospitals per state. Uh, so think about California. If you've got three hospitals here, you couldn't possibly manage the whole state with three hospitals for the veterans. Uh, <clears throat> so um, so the, the issues uh, were, and it kind of dawned on me at this time, uh, that there were um, 130 versions of the electronic medical record, which was homegrown. There was no common purchasing across the VA. Uh, there were 400 uh, facilities that were maintained but not used. Uh, the average age of the building so it was 50 years old. Um, and uh, we've got now, and it's the only service that the federal government provides directly for its citizens. A lot of things the federal government pays for, but it's the only service that they directly give to citizens. And, uh, and the VA, by the way, has now had four secretaries in four years. <clears throat> and, for, and the board of directors is about 500 people. That's Congress. <clears throat> <laughs> and uh, so it is, it, it is an organization that is, is set up uh, such that it is very difficult to change. Um, and um, it is uh, something that I thought what you, the solution would be that you would give veterans a choice. You can either go to the private sector, like 330 million other people do, <clears throat> or you can go to the VA, and that would have two results. Either the VA was gonna pick up its act and look after people and uh, drive quality and be uh, more patient friendly, um, or uh, if everybody decided to go to the private sector, they would fall under their own weight, uh, and, but the veterans uh, ultimately would be better off. Um, and what happened when you proposed so, that? So, so, so we proposed that, um, and then Trump came along uh, and asked me to take the job. And so I spent a lot of time talking to senators and representatives and so on about whether I thought we could get something like that done. And the long and the short of it was I concluded that that was not gonna be politically possible. And I didn't want to tilt windmills at that point. And so I said, no, thank you. And that's when you decided to take the Google job instead? No, they were unrelated. Okay. Um, so the VA sounds like uh, just a passion area for you. You, you actually were a veteran yourself um, from Vietnam. Yes. Um, can you share a little bit about that experience? Yeah, um, it was during the Vietnam War and when we graduated from medical school, all of us, there was a thing called the Berry Plan, and all of us graduating got a commission, guys and gals both. Um, and so you had your choice, you either went uh, after your internship, after one year of uh, uh, specialty training, or you got deferred all the way through. I got taken out after two years um, uh, of training a surgical internship, a surgical residency, <coughs> and sent um, on July 1st, I finished my uh, residency. On July 28th, I was in Vietnam, in Da Nang. I went just after the um, Tet Offensive. Um, and I was in charge of uh, uh, what's called um, the casualty staging flight. And it's very interesting, what happens is the if you get hit in the field, you get picked up by a helicopter, you're taken to a MASH unit, they stop the bleeding, splint your wounds, and then you're taken to a hospital in Da Nang or Saigon or someplace, and then you are evacuated out of the country. <clears throat> and so the casualty staging flight is where all the hospitals sent their patients uh, to be evacuated out of the country. So every day we'd get um, 50 or 100 patients to come into this facility, and there were two docs, um, um, and 11 nurses and um, dozens of corpsmen. Now I learned a bunch of things in that process. Um, the first thing I learned was 
the value of an evacuation system, that not all uh, hospitals had to be all things to all people. So we wound up and developed a, a whole transportation system for the Cleveland Clinic, and so we felt that not all hospitals need to be all things, and so the main campus is now the highest acuity hospital in the country. But the community hospitals do the deliveries and the gallbladders and the hernias, and, um, and then there's, a, there's an outpatient uh, cadre of people who look after that. And we have helicopters, fixed wings, and, um, and ambulances, and we move about uh, 30,000 patients a year from one hospital to another to, for the right care. The second thing I learned, which was really a, a great lesson, was the value that not that it was a team event and the docs didn't have to do everything. Um, and the corpsmen were fabulous. Um, they, you know, they would take x-rays, they would hang IVs, they would uh, cast wounds, they would, they were, they were terrific. And, um, and so we, you're using um, everybody practicing at the top of their um, experience. It's too bad and, we don't have that, you know, these days, it's one of the things that could bring huge costs out of the system. Well, we do, actually, our organization that. does. We have 3,600 doctors and we have 2,600 physician's assistants. And I think it's gonna be more and more that way. Uh, I suspect that someday we're gonna have equal number, if not more physician's assistants than we do physicians. For example, I, um, we have, I think, a dozen cardiac surgeons and almost 100 physician's assistants. To, to, and so as a cardiac surgeon, I never took out stitches, I never changed the dressing, I never looked for x-rays, all that stuff was done and I just operated. You could see that across healthcare, including in primary care where there's just so much, especially with more chronic Ab disease patients. Absolutely, that a and, and by assistant. the way, I think that brings us another important thing that I feel very strongly about and I think that's, that's virtual visits. And I think you heard yesterday about Kaiser. Kaiser's now well over 50% of their visits are not in-person visits. And you know, this, this dawned on me, this is really a stupid thing, but you know, so I'm out on, uh, the, west, on the East Coast on, on Nantucket Island and my daughter gets a rash on her face. This is about five years ago. And so I take a picture of it with my cell phone, I send it to the head of dermatology, it's poison ivy. You got the hookup, Micah, <laughs> it seems like. Text so, the head of So I kind of do a, a slap your forehead moment and I say, my God, think about all the things we, we could do this way. Um, and I had the worst time, I had to threaten to, ch to uh, change heads of dermatology to get them to do this. <coughs> well, you are the boss. Huh? You're the boss. I was the boss. Uh, the wizard of was. <laughs> uh, um, and that, um, and now, you know, we're seeing, for example, the neurologists see 600 virtual visits a month now. Um, they're seeing all kinds of things. The, the, the story that really changed it all was when the head of orthopedics ruptured his Achilles tendon and he saw a clinic of 23 people from home in his pajamas and scheduled three surgeries, virtually. Now think about what that means and, and we're now doing this in, um, in uh, extended nursing homes and extended care facilities, rehab facilities um, and it is, um, but the two things that are really hardest about is one, getting the physicians to change. The pajamas thing didn't help? Yeah, that helped a lot. <laughs> uh, and the second thing is getting patients so they understand. So you can, you know, we say that you can see a Cleveland Clinic doctor any day on your cell phone uh, that you want. Um, and it's been really, yeah, it's really been there's a There's a lot push. of skepticism to that. There's a, well, there's, there's skepticism, but the, the acceptance, the, the patient satisfaction is way greater that way than it is in person. When so you, you stop and think, you stop, you don't have to drive to the and park, you don't have to go in and sit in the waiting room, you don't have to go then go into the exam room and take your clothes off, um, and then repeat the whole process, which is a half a day program. Could Google? <sighs> Do it. I mean, I search for my symptoms on Google anyway. Um, why not have a pop-up on there saying, you know, talk to a doctor about it? Well, why don't you talk to Eric Schmidt about it? And I'm sure you like that. <laughs> I'm kind of hoping you could suggest that, <laughs> and then call me so I can. Okay, I'll call you. <laughs> um, so I'm going to choose an audience question because we have just a minute more. 
Um, some of these are some big questions. All right, I'll give you one. Um, what is the area of healthcare that you think is poised to change the most over the next three years? Is it um, the patient consumer space? Is it the payer space, provider, or pharma? And why? Do the, the, what are the three choices? You actually have four choices. Oh. Um, so there's pharma, providers, uh, payers, and patients. Poised to change the most. Um. I don't think it's pharma. Um, I think it probably is going to be providers are going to have to change. I think they're going to move away from major healthcare systems with more and more outpatients, more and more minimally invasive procedures. Um, I think that, that uh, will be a big change. I think they're going to, the pay is going to change, so the incentives are going to change. More or less? Uh, the, the, no, I think it's going to be done on the basis of value, moving okay. to value. Um, all of which, uh, well, you, you see Medicare has now uh, said that by 2020 it's going to be 50% uh, of at risk. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, we, we now have about 600, 700,000 patients at risk and it'll be over a million uh, uh, by 2020. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really Great. appreciate Great. this Thank you very much. Thank you so much.